All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I know it's the uh, last uh, talk slot of the day. I know I'm between you and whatever's next, which has got to be better than this. Uh, but fortunately, they don't open the, uh, the beer hall until 5 o'clock, so you at least have to stay here that long. Um, my name is Drew Mosley. I'm here to talk about uh, comparing uh, image update models in various updaters. So if that's not what you're here to see, I won't be offended if you get up and leave. I want to make sure you're here to you get the information you want. So briefly, just real quick uh, about me. I work for Toradex. I'm a technical solutions architect for our Torizon system. Uh, I have been working with updaters for seven, eight years now. I worked uh, for Mender for four years before working at Torizon. So I've got quite a bit of experience uh, with uh, embedded Linux and specifically, is that coming in and out? Oh, gotcha, okay. So, uh, you know, the, 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 that's kind of my background. Um, just a brief overview. We'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, the, the, the various OTA models, uh, specifically dual AB and OS tree uh, are the most common. Uh, and then we'll go into, I'll talk a little bit about uh, each of the, the, the four updaters you see on the screen here, um, including so, a description of how each of them handles binary deltas. And then uh, we'll go into some benchmarks uh, for some uh, common upgrade over the air update type use cases. Uh, my slides are posted on Twitter already. They're on the, the sked.com site. So feel free to take pictures if you want. Uh, but otherwise, I've got all my contact information at the end. Uh, feel free to just come and grab them uh, from there. Uh, I kind of feel like uh, you know one of these one-hit wonders playing at the, the state fair. I know you guys are all here to see the benchmark numbers, but I'm afraid if I start with that, there'll be no, no reason for you to stick around. So we're going we're gonna to save the actual numbers till later. Uh, hopefully, uh, the details I have on methodologies and things will be at least relatively interesting to you, uh, and you know maybe uh, you'll learn something. So just to give an, a, an idea, Torizon is our system, and just to give some context for, for, for this talk, uh, Torizon is a full end-to-end -end system. It's the, the client OS as well as all the uh, development tools, cloud infrastructure for over-the-air updates, remote access, that kind of thing. And so the, the, the um, background for this talk really came from some customers of ours who had very uh, tight um, uh, very very limited bandwidth connections. So they're on CAT M1 connections, on mobile devices, uh, coming in and out of uh, connectivity, and um, you know. So so we're talking you know it, it, kilobytes a second is a is a good day for some of these customers. So um, that's where the, the the background for a lot of this uh, discussion of binary deltas came from. I was talking to to some other folks. Uh, who don't really worry too much about binary deltas. If you're on a big, fat, nice, reliable data pipe, it might not be worth your time to, to, to deal with the complexity of uh, doing some of these delta update scenarios. But as I mentioned, there's roughly speaking two, two uh, broad categories of updaters. One is the dual partition updater that you see here. It's just literally redundant partitions. You're just ping-ponging back and forth between them. Typically, there's going to be a, a, a data partition uh, that, is, that allows for storing your persistent data. Uh, logic in the bootloader is responsible for deciding whether you're on the A or the B partition. The updater is going to switch you back and forth when, when the time is right. It's pretty straightforward, uh, and, and a lot of the updaters use this me mechanism. Uh, but the next mechanism is a little more complicated. So libos tree, this is, you see the long description here that came directly off their website. Uh, and there's really three main uh, components to it. One is that it's a Git-like model. So if you understand how Git stores things in a repository, it stores all files in a content addressable data store, and if it, you have the same version of a file in one, in one release and the next, they actually are hard links to the same actual object in the database, you're going to be very familiar with how OS tree does it. Uh, but unlike Git, which is main, intended to store um, source code, LibOS tree is really intended to store fully bootable file system trees. Um, so you're not going to generally, I don't even know if LibOS tree actually supports the concept of a merge like you would in Git. Uh, th there may be some esoteric features in LibOS tree, but it's not something that, uh, that, that comes up in day-to-day -day usage of it. And uh, the third main component is it's also the bootloader configuration. So just like in the previous slide with the dual AB, when you're dealing with an OS tree-based updater, uh, the, the bootloader is, is responsible for selecting the uh, appropriate configuration and the, the or excuse me, the appropriate commit to be booted at any given time. So 
I mentioned hard links. Uh, you know, if you're familiar with hard links, uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, but it's important to note that everything in OS tree is file based. It's not block based. There are some uh, systems that use like uh, ButterFS and uh, its snapshots. That's not what we're doing here. But it does require uh, that you are able to bind mount the root file system, and that's really the the, the root of how it works. Uh, there is an init ramfs that gets loaded, and it takes care of all the initialization, and it will do the, the appropriate pivot root into the, the, the proper uh, bootable file system tree. And just to kind of give the, the picture, I think this kind of really explains it. So this, the, the image on the left is the storage device. So you've got your boot directory, which has all the, the kernel, uh, all the bootloader environment information, and that kind of thing. And then you have your actual OS tree repo at the very bottom, is that's where if you look inside there, that's going to be very much like a Git repo where you see the, the directories with the, two, the, the first two characters of the commit hash and then all the objects underneath that. And then under the deploy directory, these are where you have individual commits. So in a real system, you would actually have multiple commits under that deploy OS deploy directory. Um, and then those are basically going to be hard links to objects in the repo that, that form the actual runtime directory. So let's talk about the updater. So there's really four component, uh, four contenders here that, that, that we're dealing with. Uh, like I said, I worked for Mender for four years, so I'm pretty familiar with it, although my uh, information may be a little bit out of date. Uh, the basics haven't changed. So with Mender, it's important to know that it is dual AB plus a persistent data partition. Fairly standard stuff. Uh, they do have a hosted uh, server. They also have a, an on-prem server that you can install uh, and run it yourself. It does, use, it does support standalone deployments, which is what I used for uh, capturing all these benchmarks. And basically, this is just from the device you're running Mender, giving it a URI to where the actual update artifact is stored. In my case, I just am running a, uh, a local web server, and I pull it down that way. Um, the binary deltas implemented with uh, Mender use the X-Delta compression tool. Uh, it is part of the commercial offering. They were uh, generous enough to give me access uh, for the purposes of doing these benchmarks. In, for, in Mender's case, it does require uh, that the root file system is read-only and that is completely unmodified. So the idea is that you specify what version you're going from and what version you're going to. And if that from has changed, you're out of luck. It won't work. Um, I use the default tuning values. There are additional uh, compression uh, values that you can change. I didn't mess with any of those. So your mileage may vary on any, indip any individual use case. You might be able to tweak those a little bit to get slightly better, uh, better performance, but I did not uh, go into that level of detail. So the next one up is RALC, and this one I know I've talked to a few folks about today. Um, again, dual AB plus persistent data partitions. Uh, it is compatible with Hawkbit deployment server, uh, but it also has that standalone uh, deployment, which again is what I used. I didn't bother with setting up a server in this case. And they, RALC has two mechanisms for supporting uh, adaptive or delta updates. One, they use CA sync, which is defined as a content addressable data synchronization tool. I've read some blog posts about it. Uh, I have not gone into a whole lot of depth on how it works, but uh, uh, it, one of the advantages of this particular uh, mechanism is it can be used on uh, UBI-based raw NAND flash, whereas most of the other systems uh, will not work on, on raw, raw NAND. Uh, and there is a bundle format that, that, that I use for the benchmarks here called Verity. Uh, one interesting thing about this is read-only is not required. Uh, so you can actually have a read-write file system, and your root file system may have changed. And basically the way it works is it, it, it breaks the, the disk up into blocks, sends a list of blocks over, or the checksums for the blocks, and says, hey, do you have this uh, checksum? If you already have it on the device, you don't have to download it. Otherwise, you will download it. So. In general, it's probably not going to be as efficient as a, uh, as a fully statically determined binary delta, uh, but it does give you some more flexibility should you have the need to have a system where you want to allow read-write on the, the root file system. And the second mechanism used by RALC is uh, what they call block-based adaptive updates. Um, you see here it's uh, 4K blocks with a 256 uh, SHA checksum. Again, read-only not required. Very similar uh, in concept to the, the CA sync model, uh, but we'll see some of the numbers. And the, 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 there's uh, some minor differences, but uh, functionally speaking, the, I didn't notice anything uh, terribly different. 
Uh, SW update uh, is the next one. Again, dual AB, persistent data partition. Uh, SW update is the, the only one of these that also, as far as I know, supports asymmetric updates, the idea being you boot into an update mode and you don't need a fully redundant partition. Uh, I didn't do anything with that because my interest was when you're dealing with uh, devices in the field and you're doing fully uh, dual AB uh, redundant partitions. This is also compatible with the Hawkbit deployment server, but like the others, uh, I use the on-device web UI. Basically, you just pull up uh, a web UI pointing at a port on the device and, and drag and drop the file, uh, and that's what I was able to use for the benchmarks. And this uses an algorithm called Zchunk, conceptually similar to what I described for uh, CAsync. Um, basically, you're, you're again, you're, you're capturing the blocks, checksums, which ones you have, which ones you don't have. It's all calculated on the device, so it's a little bit more resource intensive on the device, but uh, it does give you some flexibility if you do ha have the need for a uh, read-write root file system. And the, the last one is Horizon. Of course, this is what my day job is. Uh, this is the, the only one of the, the four that I benchmarked that is a single partition managed using uh, OS tree. Uh, I did use the Horizon Cloud deployment server, which is an Uptain compliant uh, server, um, simply because of the complexity of setting up a uh, local deployment. Uh, it's on my list to uh, be able to do some uh, things where the, I'm actually deploying from locally just for better comparison. But I figured at, at worst, this is going to uh, be a little bit slower, shouldn't really change the amount of data that is needed. Um, and, and the difference, uh, since it's a single partition, there's a couple other conceptual differences. So the, um, any, any object that is managed by libOS tree is defined as read-only. So all those items that we saw in that diagram a few pages back, those are managed by libOS tree. Uh, and so those will be read-only. Um, slash var generally is completely unmanaged. In, in the case of Horizon, uh, that's where we store uh, container uh, volumes and things like that and user application data. So that's completely unmanaged by OS tree. And, and Etsy is a special case. It's actually uh, read-write, but there's a three-way merge that happens when you're, when you're doing deployments over the air. Um, so it, it does give you the flexibility to modify the config files without, uh, without uh, breaking your ability to update. And it, this is also an adaptive update model, kind of similar to what we discussed uh, previously. Only newer modified objects need to be downloaded. So you've got that uh, object repository on the device. If uh, you know, between release three and four, only four files have been modified or changed, I only have to download those four uh, objects and I create that new bootable file system tree with the hard links. Um, an additional size reduction, OS tree has a feature called OS tree static updates. And this goes back to the, the customers I was talking about with the, the, the really restrictive modems. Um, Typically with uh, OS tree, you're going to get fairly good speed up just by the virtue of the fact that you're only downloading new or modified objects. But if you need to go even further, uh, th it has some heuristic algorithms where it can figure out, okay, if I need to download these four objects, which objects are they closest to that I might already have and actually do a binary delta at the file level on those, fi uh, on those particular files to help reduce even further the amount of data you need to download. And another uh, big advantage uh, that, that we've noticed when you do the when you use this OS tree static delta, it ra drastically reduces the number of HTTP GET requests that go to our server. So when you're typically when you're doing a standard OS tree update, every object is an HTTP GET request. And so when you're using the OS tree static deltas, it's actually an archive, some kind of tar file. Uh, and so instead of you know thousands of uh, a, uh, individual objects being downloaded, you're actually only downloading a few archive files. So that, that also helps quite a bit reducing, uh, reducing the amount of uh, data and time it takes to do these updates. So the hardware that I used uh, was a Tordex uh, Verden IMX8 M Mini with the Xora carrier board. You see them on uh, the screen here. Block-based EMMC storage. Um, I, all the uh, local and standalone deployments were done just over my local area network using uh, gigabit uh, ethernet to my, to my desktop, so uh, there was no additional delays, uh, additional network delays included. Uh, for Horizon, as I said, I did use the Horizon Cloud just for simplicity. Uh, I would like to maybe revisit that in the future. 
And then in all cases, uh, I used the Toradex Easy Installer for initial board installation. So I had to do some porting of uh, integrating of RALC and uh, SW Update. Mender was already integrated on the Toradex boards, and obviously Torizon was. So briefly, the methodology that I used. I started with a standard Horizon repo manifest, uh, distros and that kind of thing. Uh, when built is a, somewhere in the 350 to 400 megabyte range, depending on exactly which version, uh, which release you're using and that kind of thing. So that's kind of my starting point. Um, I had to hack the heck out of it to get it allow me to disable OS tree, because uh, that's not really something <laughs> that, that, that our uh, setup was uh, designed to, to provide. And then I added uh, additional layers to my configuration for additional update systems, and I wanted to be able to install Chromium to have uh, some significant package that, I, that I'm uh, deploying over the air. And uh, then I had to implement Verden IMX mini support on both SW Update and RALC. And then I built what we call our Horizon minimal image. Okay, and this took a lot longer than I expected it to, but. Uh, uh, I guess, given the complexity of everything, uh, it's not terribly surprising. Then we trigger the update, and I'm using TCP dump and Wireshark uh, to measure the conversation size. You see a screenshot I grabbed uh, from, from one of them here uh, to show the amount of data that, that, that is being pulled uh, for each individual update. But the main goal was to minimize the differences between the setups. I couldn't get them exactly the same, just some of the requirements. RALC requires certain kernel configuration parameters to be set. Uh, you know, obviously, OS tree is a very invasive change. So um, the, the, the goal here is not to get exact, uh, you know, completely 100% perfect numbers every time. Uh, it's, it's really to kind of get a sense of where the systems are in comparison to each other for common update use cases. So the, the upgrade scenarios uh, that, that uh, I tested, um, the first one, no update for this. It's just the initial install of Horizon version 6.2.0 uh, for each of the, 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 uh, the four upgraders. Uh, so the first actual update, I just changed a single file in Etsy with one byte plus the Mender artifact name for uh, the Mender case uh, and did a full image update as kind of my baseline. And then the next step, I did the, a similar one byte change, and I then, then I did the, the Delta update uh, for, for that particular version. And then the, third, the, the next step was to install Chromium uh, with a Delta update. Now, this is not typically something we see our users doing. If you're going to have Chromium, it's going to be on there from the beginning. But I figured for completeness sake, I'd go ahead and, and, and do it this way. So the next thing was to upgrade Chromium. Now, this is something we do see our customers doing, uh, although typically in our case, Chromium is going to be in a container, so, uh, but we do have some users that are, are putting things like that in the base operating system. And so another one that's not terribly common is I uninstall Chromium because I just got tired of uh, something in my shared state cache uh, getting messed up and having to wait two hours for the Chromium build to finish. And the, as the last step, which is probably the most common thing that our users would end up doing, is upgrading from one uh, minor release to the next. So in this case, I just went, jumped straight from 6.2 to 6.5, uh, which happened to be uh, our latest release. And so with those, uh, the, those scenarios, I'm hoping to cover kind of the, the, the common upgrade scenarios that, that, that people will be using these uh, systems for. All right, so now we get into the real numbers here. So this is the first one. I, I should have uh, should have started numbering at zero, so this this one could actually be one, but I didn't think about that till I got to the end. So this is the full image update with um, basically a 350 megabyte image with only a one byte change. So um, in, in in all of the updaters have compression built in, that's why you're not seeing 350 megs downloaded. But you see that Mender, RALC, and SW Update are all roughly the same. Uh, they're using very similar compression algorithms. Uh, this is where Horizon is uh, with the OS tree it, it, it has quite a significant advantage. Obviously, in this case, since there's only one file and plus metadata, we're only, in this case, downloading 12 megabytes as opposed to about 130 megabytes. So uh, this is where OS tree uh, performs significantly better. So now with the Delta update, uh, so this is the same as the previous slide, only now we're doing a Delta update. And I had to change my uh, units to kilobytes here because Mender performed very well here uh, at 232 kilobytes. Uh, the Horizon standard without the static deltas that I mentioned uh, is uh, about 12 megabytes, I guess. 
Um, and then you see the others, they're, they're, they're uh, slightly higher. And then OS tree static deltas gets that size down even further to 96 kilobytes. Okay, so now we're moving on into um, potentially more interesting things. Installing Chromium, fairly level across, not surprising. Most of these objects are going to be new, so uh, we're not going to see any, uh, any real significant changes here. Uh, but it's interesting to see that, you know, basically all the options uh, performed, performed similarly. Uh, you'll notice that, like, for instance, on RALP, where we have two options, uh, it looks like the adaptive updates uh, are uh, a little bit worse in this case than the CA sync updates. Uh, I think, it, was it the other way around in the previous one? Uh, it looks like CA sync's quite a decent amount better. So you're going to have to play with this based on your actual use cases, but uh, they're, they're, they're not significantly different here. Okay, so now we're upgrading Chromium. Like I said, this is a, kind of a more interesting use case. Uh, in this case, Mender actually performed the best. Uh, recall that the Mender uh, model is fully read-only, so you're, you're actually completely calculating that delta offline, uh, as opposed to RALC and uh, CA sync at about you know, 130 to 150 megabytes, um, which, uh, with, with the, their adaptive update models. Uh, Terizon, the, the non-static deltas you see here is about 21, 120, and then with the static deltas, we were able to reduce that just a little bit further. So, uh, again, not, uh, not significant differences, uh, but uh, in this case, Mender, Mender is the best performing of the three, or excuse me, of the four. So now we uninstall Chromium. I'm not sure how, how, how interesting these numbers are uh, since, again, I don't anticipate people will be doing this for devices in the field, but I figured for completeness sake, I'd grab these numbers. And so the last one here is when we're upgrading to uh, Horizon version 6.5.0. And the, the, the difference between 6.2 and 6.5 is three quarters, I believe, of you know, whatever changes go into the, the Kirkston branches uh, in that three quarters between 6.2 and 6.5. So that kind of gives you an idea of the time frame here. Um, and, and you see, again, Mender, Mender's, quite a bit, Mender's a little bit less than the others at about 75 megabytes. Uh, RALC, both uh, CA sync and adaptive, 115, 130 megabytes. SW update also at 130 megabytes. Uh, Terizon, 113. And then with the static deltas, we're able to reduce that down to 55. And then, so I've got here just all the data on one slide. I won't go through it all again, but uh, these are the, the, the basic numbers. You kind of get an idea of where we're going here. And so next steps here. Um, I clean up all my work and submit the board support, maybe. Uh, I haven't done full validation for things like RALC and uh, SW update on the Horizon board, so I haven't decided if it's worthwhile to submit what I have into the RALC uh, community and SW update boards layers. Uh, I do want to set up a CAS configuration for repeatability because I, I find this, uh, the way I was doing it here, there was a lot of manual steps. I did the best I could to, to get it to, uh, Reasonably repeatable, but uh, if I could set up a CAS configuration, I think that would make it uh, a little bit simpler. Uh, I do want to do a blog write-up. I know my marketing team is pushing me hard for that, uh, including the update times and how long it took to do most of these updates. Um, another thing that came up, uh, there are some, uh, in the Google Summer of Code, there's a couple open projects related to Uptain to uh, enhance Uptain to support dual partition updates, which uh, I guess it doesn't today. So uh, our, our system architect who's working on the Uptain side is, it, it has been uh, uh, trying to get this information from me on how to get things like SW Update and RALC working on the Toradex hardware so that we could uh, potentially work with those summer, uh, summer code projects to uh, get that functionality into Uptain and maybe get it rolled out. And then I'd also uh, be interested in uh, other interesting update scenarios. So the con my contact information here, if you have specific uh, update scenarios that you think are interesting and want to reach out, like I say, if you want to get my slides there on Twitter there, you don't need to, to, to uh, uh, go digging too hard for them. And I guess we've got a few minutes, uh, a few minutes for questions. If there are any, I'm, I guess I was a little quicker than I thought I'd be, but uh, that just gives us more time to get over to the, the beer bash. And we've got a microphone if anybody has any questions.
Thanks for a great talk and doing uh, all that hard work for us. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, you mentioned that uh, LibOS3 does a lot of HTTP requests and you were testing on a local network. Like, What do you think would be uh, the impact on real performance in the field if the device has like a lot of latency? Because SW update, Rauk, Mender, I'm not too sure, but I think they make like one or two HTTP requests for a Delta update. Yeah, uh, that's that, that, that's probably true. Uh, for but for for libos tree, I actually wasn't doing local area because I didn't set up the OS tree on my server. So I actually was pulling from uh, our server. Uh, but I've got a pretty high speed data pipe to my house, so that wasn't too much of a problem. For our customers in particular that are having this issue, uh, we did note they did notice a significant improvement. Whether that was mostly due to the reduction in number of HTTP requests or the reduction of the data size, we're not sure. But uh, overall, it was significantly better for them. They, they literally had some boards that, due to going in and out of connectivity and stuff, would take on the order sometimes of several months to actually complete an update because they would just get halfway through and then lose connectivity and reboot and have to start all over. And once we actually implemented the static deltas, they were able to update most of those boards in just a couple hours. So it's 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 much more reasonable in those case in those rare cases where you're on you know out in the middle of nowhere on a very very low bandwidth uh, connection. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. So first, the disclaimer, I'm the one who has the other Delta update talk tomorrow morning. Um, and, and I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, great. And uh, one question about reducing the Delta size. So did you do any measures to um, make things as reproducible as possible and also avoid that you scramble up the file system when just adding one file so that the Delta still is only basically the Delta and not the whole rest of the file system no i didn't i did i didn't dig that that deep i mean i had a yocto setup i made my change i ran my build i ran the binary delta tool and i deployed the update which is i figure kind of the way most of the users are going to be doing it so uh, i didn't want to get into too much detail until yes. i at least had a baseline for comparison now if there are ways to optimize it that might be part of you know my next talk on this. Yeah, actually, this is uh, a good starting point to further reduce the delta by making sure you really build things reproducibly. Right. Yeah, and I know uh, one of the one of the engineers I talked to at my company that knows a lot more about OS Tree than I do. He claims that there are definitely uh, heuristic improvements to improve that static delta algorithm. Uh, right now, it's so much better than it was, but if there 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 may be even further options uh, on the on the OS Tree side for sure. Thanks. Uh, Maybe, maybe more general in your talk, is there, are there things that can be done in the build of the operating system, whether it's build root or, or open embedded or whatever, to improve over the air update latencies and download speeds, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, certainly reproducible builds can help. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, the, 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 the problem that we, we see is, you know, going from one release to the next, it's death by a thousand cuts, right? If you look at the, the, the amount of changes that are going into the Kirkston branch right now, you know, one quarter to the next quarter, you know, who knows what packages have changed. So, um, you know, we have talked about are there ways to reduce the amount of churn uh, that, that, that goes in at the source level to therefore reduce at the binary level. But then, then you have to decide, well, okay, but what changes don't I want to bring in for the next release? So uh, hopefully... You know, the older Kirkston gets, the less changes are going to be there. So, uh, I did, presumably, as we move further and uh, in, in down into later releases, there there will be significantly less change at the at the binary level. Thanks. Just throw the mic. <laughs> So a lot of what you talked about was with lib OS tree, specifically with Terizon. Is there any other um, update system that uses lib OS tree? There are some other systems for sure. Uh, I was at a talk just a little bit ago on Apertis uh, from guys from Bosch. 
which they use OS tree. I know there are some desktop distros that use uh, use OS tree or a variant thereof. Fedora Silverblue and all of its spinoffs, they use uh, OS tree for the base OS as well as uh, R uh, RPM OS tree to allow you to to, to actually layer uh, package based updates on that. Uh, there are a number of other embedded systems. I believe the Foundry's uh, micro platform also uses OS tree. Uh, one of the things I'm actually interested in uh, that I haven't actually played with yet is the idea of using BTRFS snapshots. Uh, I gave a talk last week in Nuremberg at Embedded World about immutable uh, desktop style distros. And so Fedora Silverblue is one of them, but there's a number of, uh, of the desktop style distros that are actually using BTRFS snapshots instead of OS tree. Uh, for for allowing those kind of updates, so uh, there's there's definitely uh, a lot of interesting work being done in that area. And you know, I I, I guess ultimately your question about OS tree probably comes down to reliability uh, versus uh, versus dual partition. And we have not noticed any uh, significant reliability issues. Uh, it's very very carefully designed to allow for exactly atomic updates and that kind of thing. It's all based on you know essentially a, a sim link that gets created at the very end of the update process to give you that 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 uh, at, uh, atomic based update. And I know Toradex is a hardware company, so I'm I'm assuming Torizon was built for their hardware. Does Torizon run on other? Hard yeah, good question. Uh, so that's actually something we probably within the last six months have really started pushing. We've got an open source uh, version of Torizon uh, called Common Torizon that runs on non Toradex hardware. So we've got you know the usual suspects: Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone, uh, x86, Kimu, that kind of thing. Because uh, we do have a number of customers that come to us and they like what we have on, and they want to migrate to our hardware, but they already have stuff in the field and they they kind of want a halfway step. So. And I can use that with your updater? Yeah, yeah, it's all, all of our Yocto layers are open source. Uh, you can use our updater if you use our cloud services. Of course, there's a fee for that, but the actual, all the, all the um, client OS and development tools and everything, that's all uh, open source. Anybody else? I hope. I hope this is not a little, I hope this is not off topic. You mentioned Uptane, so I'll ask you, uh, do you have an opinion on Uptane and what is it? Okay, um, I am not the architecture uh, security uh, guru on that. With the way I usually describe Uptane is uh, it is a, a um, system from the automotive space for deploying over the air updates to automotive systems. And if you're familiar at all with automotive systems, you know they're a lot more complicated than your typical uh, you know, embedded IoT type device. So it's basically a, set, a specification of what keys are defined, what they're used to, uh, to, to, um, to sign and verify, and essentially what attack scenarios that is intended to protect. So um, in, you know, in, in the typical case, you would sign your artifact, and on the device, you've got a key that can verify the signature. In Uptain, it goes one step further and actually signs the entire contents of the repository. And there's all sorts of metadata and things that that, that go on. And so, uh, you know, the, the the problem with a single uh, key signing an artifact is if that artifact is on a USB key in a drawer and you pull it out six months later, uh, it's still going to install. Whereas the, there are mechanisms in in Uptain to make that revocation that much easier because you're actually signing the contents of the entire repository instead of just a single artifact. Uh, but beyond that, I, I, I would be lying if, I, if I, I tried to give you any more details than that. Do you have an opinion on it, though? I, we like it. Okay, cool. That's great. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I, 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 I'm not the one that has to implement it. So, <laughs> you know, from my perspective, uh, it, it, does, it does protect a lot of attack scenarios, which, which, which is pretty important. Anybody else? All right, well, I guess we got, I'll give you five minutes back and we can go uh, up to, I guess, the fifth floor where they, they're having the tux race or whatever the heck it is. Thank you. Okay.